What up, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Jet Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, we've been holding off, Brian, because we've been waiting for the episodes to be done so that we can discuss both episode nine and ten. Episode five is still, you can, it's debatable which one is the better episode, but episode nine, Brian, let's get into that. Well, I mean, first off, the show is in the books, and, you know, congrats to everyone involved for. Yes, delivering definitely. an instant classic yeah uh, this is this will be one you revisit this will be one that you know you when, when kids are old enough you uh sit them down and you start with some of the original but then you say look we're, we're getting to we're getting to 97 and, and you'll be very glad when we do so yeah. you know i think start to finish this is one of the most consistent highest level pieces of programming that that marvel's put together so I mean, hats off to everyone involved I do agree with you. I think the high point of this series was episode five. I don't think we quite ever got back to that. Um, and I actually preferred episode nine to episode 10, if I'm being honest. Um, 10 was ten was good. It was, it, you know, it was kind of more, a little more predictable in its beats, if you will, if not in its outcomes. Um, but I enjoyed the action of nine a little bit more than the action of 10. Nine had more of the, because of what had happened in five, you kind of were guarded against something tragic happening again. I felt like I was still very much in that. Whereas I felt like by the time we got to episode 10, it did have a little more of that formulaic sense of everyone's going to get to strut their stuff and it's going to kind of be this constant one-upsmanship where we just can't get rid of the bad guy. I could anticipate 10's beats a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Nine felt more unpredictable all the way up yeah. until the moment that they ripped right from the comics to kind of... That, and that the is the moment everybody is talking about, has spoken about. Um, and they're, they're referring to the comic called Fatal Attractions, correct? Yes. So this is literally is, like the story. This is almost like a storyboard of a literal comic page that exists that happened. Brian, isn't that isn't isn't it amazing? Doesn't it feel amazing to see something like that? Everybody right now is is in awe of an idea that they sort of. We'll talk about the Rock later, but he did it with his motion graphic when he did the first teaser of Black Adam and did the storyboard. And there were uh, MCU called Marvel Knights, Brian. There were episodes of called Marvel Knights. It was graphic, uh, motion graphics. This is why I asked you a few uh, a few episodes ago about bringing the 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 Infinity Gauntlet saga to to, to life. So there it is. There it is, Brian. I'd be curious because you're always you always have the visual eye that's more educated than mine. It felt to me because nine and ten were much more action intensive. It felt to me like the animation style of the action reminded me more of almost like anime or Certainly adult. The elements you know of what anime. I'm saying? Like the way it was drawn, and right up until that moment of, of Wolverine being I don't know what you want to call it, but like <laughs> gutted literally. I, I guess. But the and there were moments leading up to that, like just poses, angles, the way the destruction was playing out, the way the powers were being displayed. It did. It really reminded me a lot more of like a blue samurai style of choreography than what I traditionally associate with Marvel or, or even DC at its at its high points. And I, I just am wondering if other people noticed or felt the same adult nature of the action that was being shown. I got to see, man. We got to try to reach out to these individuals and try to find out their inspiration, man, because they did a lot of great stuff here. And I thought the same about that shot. So when the metal is pulled out of Wolverine's body, the way the three dimensions are shot, that's what I mean. It felt very animated to me, the way, way it freeze frames, the way it stops, it pauses so you can see it. Yeah. That's what I mean. It didn't. That didn't feel like... You know, regular animation. Yeah, a regular comic book adaptation animation. Didn't feel like that to me. I'll say this. Shout outs to Neil. He said he never liked the X-Men. And I was like, what? <laughs> Wait, you mean X-Men, the characters or the, the show? The, the show. show. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I was like, oh, because he didn't like the animation. And I get it. The animation wasn't that great. So there were some instances that it were okay. But I was more into the storylines, right? Uh, but this one, I told them like, yo, the, the animation in this one is just 
uh, is up there. If you like What If, and, and he does like What If, so I told him, yo, you got to watch this. I think this is better than What If, though. Maybe oh, it's definitely. because of the creativity of how they're using the technology, but it looks a little better to me than some of the What If, which actually does look quite good at, at its yes, high Yes, yes. No, I like the What If stuff. Uh, Brian, I think the moment for me where obviously a line was crossed and the shots that they used to sort of uh, point that out with some close-up shots after he, he you know, he, he sticks him with it. And we got to talk about Xavier. Xavier, you got to... No, no, no. We got that's his whole... <laughs> save that. Save that. That's a whole... That is a... Th this, this show was a setup. Oh, my God. Professor X. Yeah, Professor yeah. X got X'd. This is... This is well, but, we'll um, get to that. The close-up shots and Magneto was like, oh, snap, that's what we're doing? It was, that's, that's basically what it was. That's So it shows you, Brian, Magneto could have done this anytime he wanted to. Yeah. He had that level of respect for him yep. until he crossed the line. He was like, word? He, he crossed the line. What did you think of that moment? Uh, Magneto won the series. I don't know what oh, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what. I, 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 the, He's the MVP the, if we had to have the, the list. series and the series is clearly designed to make you to bring you to his perspective and his vantage point. We've been talking about this in all of our shows at every turn. Right. I always use the Cobra Kai analogy, but this show has gone way past that. Like this is the complete subversion of who is actually the hero or at least the protagonist, right? Exactly, That's not necessarily exactly, the exactly. same thing. It's not clear sometimes. But by the end of this season, I mean, if you're polling, I mean, Magneto's approval rating has to be like 93%. Before this show, you would have probably said like, it's somewhere between 45 and 55, depending on how you, how you view these characters and the interplay through the years. Everything to me about the way Charles Xavier is written because we were waiting for this when he comes yeah. back. The writing is designed to when you hear it, you're kind of like, oh, not this again. But then to your point, this guy who talks about morality and talks about righteousness, man, he breaks more rules and crosses more boundaries than any other character. Yeah, because... And he like does it in these two episodes to the point where you're like, I don't... I don't Brian, know. I'll say this. I'll, I'll say this, and then we will move on. He he gives you a choice. If it don't go his way, then he has to. Then he has a choice. Last resort sort of stuff. And he will do that to anybody if the decision he be if he's so. That's the problem. It's like so. That's what I'm saying. Like so, Magneto's imprisoned after the genocide on Genosha. He escapes. He saves the day, literally, in episode eight with enough. He then effectively is, in, you know, Xavier immediately starts to try to manipulate him effectively back to the same old chess match that we've always seen between these two, leading to the confrontation at the end of episode nine, where there's the shock value of how he serves Wolverine. But was anyone in that moment hating him for doing that nah because that's what i'm saying everybody understood yo is that what we do <laughs> so that's what i mean that's what it was he literally takes that step with a beloved character who we'll get to kind of really remains on the sidelines for most of the show but he does that straight from the pages of the comics and you don't actually view him as this diabolical killer when he does it yeah, yeah, yeah. Which then leads to an episode 10. Who do they need to save the day again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He won the series. I'm that's, I mean, to me, the one of the number one things going into in season two is how long does the writing allow that to continue? Is that going to be like the through line of this show that actually that Magneto is sort of this con morally conflicted, but he's ultimately the lead and the continued protagonist of the series? Or is season one setting up a a whiplash reversion to he's going way too far um, in whatever they're going to do with Apocalypse and we're going to need Xavier's virtues to kind of recenter this somehow. Two things. Number one, Magneto 
is someone who has experienced a horrific trauma and has to somehow get over the fact that it was done to him by, you know, you know, regular humans. And so he obviously doesn't want the same thing to repeat. So this is like more of his journey. Um, and because if he, Ryan, obviously we have other, and shout outs to me because I said Apocalypse was going to show up. Yeah, you did. Uh, <laughs> you got that right in the, te- in the, in the, in the, in the post credit. Yeah. yeah. Without Magneto, Brian, we have Bastion, which doesn't really last too long, right? For another season or so. Or no, right? you can't. You can't roll him for a whole season. Yeah. Uh, so Magneto's story is 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 the one that because his whoever's writing Mag- Magneto, man, is like you can listen to this dude talk, and his 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 words aren't unjustified Brian. the second thing i understand scott for being mad because this dude calls out to the x-men and by the time they get back this dude is asleep are you kidding me brian this dude said he did his thing and he said hey uh i'm about to go take it <laughs> i mean you know jet lag she are to earth that's that's a long way I mean, you could have slept something in that that trip. That trip wasn't like that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sheesh. I mean, again, the conversations are are a, a key driving point. They are the key driving point of this show. What was your reaction to like him? His justification, attempted justification to Scott and Gene over over what he did and why he did it. I mean, I get it. It's it's sort of. Uh, I think. <clears throat> the fatherly thing to want for his uh, kin to 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 want to do live the life you know and, he, and obviously he felt that for them he knew that they both had obviously something for everybody knows right and he wanted them to enjoy that life but in the speech is like ultimately you're gonna end up here again but to me, Professor X's fatherly approach is much more like the one you take with like a six-year-old than with an adult, right? When you're a parent of a six-year-old, you create the illusion of choice. Mm-hmm. You give them two options that you're in control of mm-hmm. and you let the child choose. Mm-hmm. And effectively, by leaving everything to Magneto, isn't that what X was doing? He didn't trust Scott and Jean to actually take over. So he put Magneto in charge to basically be like, yeah, I wanted you to have a f- your own life, but make no mistake, that life is not going to include choosing to run and succeed me because I gave that spot to Eric. Yeah, See, yeah. that's like, I'd be mad too. They were his first. They were like his first students. They should be like his firstborn. That's like being cut out of the will. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, that's why, like, and it wasn't even like the one of the three worst things that I thought Professor X was <laughs> written to do in these last two episodes. Cause like they lead with that. Cause you're waiting for that conversation and you're like, okay, that's pretty, that's pretty weak, in, in my opinion, manipulative. And I don't blame them for being angry at him. Yeah, yeah. Then he tries <clears throat> to have his conversation with Magneto the first time, which obviously then leads to the confrontation where you're kind of like, I don't really know who I'm rooting for here. And then, are we okay with what he did in episode 10? Like, are we okay with the way he resurrected Magneto's mind? Because he, I mean, to your point about wiping minds, yeah, he brought him back, but he clearly was editing as he was going through. And I'm like watching that being like, uh, this is why we, this is why we have issues with Charles Xavier and his telepathy, because he does stuff like this. Yeah, he's feeding you info to make you remember certain aspects and not enti- the entire story. Correct. Yeah. I mean, right? yeah, I, I, as you were watching it, you was like, damn, this is this is not right. This isn't right. What he's doing. I was like, I was like, they passed laws against this if they knew he was doing this. Like oh, maybe there should snap. be a mutant registration act, right? Like this is the kind of stuff where you see this and you're like Cause you already saw it, like you give me no choice. You get it, he said, you give me no choice. Yeah. <laughs> I got to do what I got to do. But then he always says, like, you know, I got to save his mind. I got to save my friend. And then you watch how he does it. And you're like, man, I don't know. 
Like, if this is rescuing, like, I... One thing, Brian, that I'm not looking forward to, Brian, is the constant revisiting of this philosophy, I guess, Brian, between the two. There has to be some sort of uh, uh, end to that uh, power struggle, I would say. Well, At I would some agree. point. Yeah. I think, well, I think season two to me, Charles Xavier has to evolve. Um, that's how, what I would say. I think in season one, the emphasis clearly was on Magneto's progression and sort of the steps he took in inheriting the school, inheriting the X-Men. You know, he does for, you know, probably for mostly for his own ends, but he goes through the exercise, which leads to Genosha. And then we see the unleashing of his power, but then, you know, acts of heroism. So he's a dynamic character, even relative to, I think, what he was in the 90s show. Xavier, to me, is pretty much the same. Yeah. And so I think in season two, the chess match has to be, you have to write him to grow in some way, whether that's an admission of guilt, an admission of fault, some change in his methodology in terms of how he leads the team right. like that has to be evident in season two because you're right if we're doing this exercise for three seasons it won't work it works really well in in this context and it was clearly by design so the, i'm interested to see like where do we go based upon the time periods they all end up in how does that maybe change um his th his thought process but i will say my my Maybe my favorite, though, little scene within the thing was the flashback to the two of them meeting and discovering that they're mutants. I thought that was a really cool scene where they're sitting in the bar and they kind yeah. of are like they don't they're kind of measuring each other and not really trusting each other. And then they reveal that they're both mutants. But this was like, in his mind. Yeah, exactly. But I thought yeah. that was actually really well. But it was also, I think, meant to be like a flashback of something that did happen. Probably, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I actually really liked how they played that. It like almost... Yeah, and it felt like weirdly it was almost like part romantic, but then part friendship, and then yeah, part yeah, yeah, yeah. you got that sense of like discrimination, exclusion. You know, it was I thought that was really it was well, well done. done. And that's like to put that as the prelude to what became kind of like a nonstop action finale. I thought actually was a pretty smart thing to do. Yeah. In which episode did the Phoenix show up? Ten, and and that yeah. If you want to talk, that was part of my thing about one upsmanship that I kind of didn't wasn't my favorite aspect of yeah of because I, and, I, and most people i follow uh this guy screen crush um on youtube and 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 for the most part he was just breaking down stuff but he pointed that one specific thing about not liking in, in terms of that episode because it's just that mcguffin it's like you're waiting for that thing to come out and save all, you know, and 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 it's sort of like a cop out. But uh, how how did you feel about that appearance, and how will you feel uh, feel about it going forward in the future when it does arrive at some point again? Well, the future, I'll, I'm willing <clears throat> to wait and see, given how good this show was. But I got to be honest, I kind of knew it was coming. Yeah, because the, again, the way the momentum of that sequence was starting. Where like I was like, okay, so this is the moment where everyone's going to showcase their powers to maximum ability. You're, they're going to think they have Bastion contained or stopped how many times, and they're going to need successive higher powers to try to contain him. And so I almost was waiting for it. Like the second she disappeared or whatever, I was like, oh, here comes the Phoenix. And like, there it was. And it almost felt like a cameo. Like it almost felt like a... Like, like we're doing this for the fans, but I, I didn't like it. I didn't think it was necessary and I didn't love it. Um, and like I said, it just kind of led to like, okay, then he gets stepped on by the Sentinel and then that's not enough. And like, it just, you know, he's hit with all the power. I, I just, that's the one part of the action that felt a little more formulaic and quite honestly felt a little more Marvel. Like we've had this issue with Marvel finales kind of devolving into sort of, now this was better executed because it yeah. looked cooler. So I was yeah. okay with it. I don't, don't, don't take it as like, I hated it. I just, yeah. it wasn't my favorite action sequence of the show. Um, and I wasn't, I guess I wasn't really awed in the same way that I was in episode nine or in episode five. Um, and so that's why I kind of was like, when the Phoenix showed up, I kind of was like, well, yeah, this is sort of, this is sort of on brand for what this scene is doing. Yeah. One of my favorite scenes, Brian, when they were, uh, 
combining their powers and 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 the music was changed for that for that moment. Yes, that was dope. That, that was, was cool. It's that, like yeah. that's it. they ripped the theme at that point. That was cool. Yeah, yeah, that was dope. Though. I love that scene. One more thing about the powers. So as we kind of keep peeking at the live action future of this, I did think this like nine and ten was a good a good template for how the X-Men have credible powers to deal with global threats, right? Because if you're kind of sitting there being like, well, and, and by the way, I did love the fact that the Avengers keep popping up. I love the little shots of like, oh, like yeah, there's oh, Iron Man. Yeah, oh, oh, the cameo. Oh, See, there's like Captain you said before, oh, Brian. Samurai. Oh, there's Like, there's, like there's you Daniel. said before, like, Brian, this is how you do cameos. Yeah. And it's like, they even gave you a little Daredevil action shot. He's in a little trouble. Like, I was like, this is cool. This is like, we're getting the sense of the universe but we're getting a sense of why the X-Men are major players in this universe. There's no B team, right? There's no like, hey, we they deal with the local stuff and then we call the Avengers for the global stuff. Like, no, these these these, these guys can deal with the global stuff. They and they, they can deal with the global stuff, but they deal with craziness. Yeah. And so they I think this did a very good job. That is out yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. did a very good job of, of like outlining, hey, their powers are distinct and the mutations allow them to do things that even the Avengers can't do. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that was, that was actually really, really well executed, but, but yeah, I loved, uh, Dr. Strange doing surgery. I was like, this is, I was like, they got it. They got everybody in here. Yeah. So. Um, we had the 24 minute mark. <clears throat> what, is there anything, what, what did you think, Brian, of where this is going? Cause when I saw it, I was like, okay, well, so you were right. Hopefully it doesn't turn into Mayor Humdinger. That's what I'm that's what that's what my I'm afraid of. It didn't look like it. I like we gonna we're gonna I like that we're gonna see two versions, Brian. That's dope. Yeah. And that, yeah. and that he uh, uh, I just the way they left this off, Brian, is like we're getting closer to the time frame. Remember in those episodes back in the day of X Men when they show the tombstones of. So at that point, are they really dead or are they just missing in the future and in the past? That's interesting. So, yeah, it is an interesting question. And I think one thing it clearly indicates is this show is going for a lot more in season two. Like, this was a pretty linear show that had a little sidebar for the Shi'ar stuff. Clearly, when you do multiple timelines uh involving apocalypse you're you know now it's almost like they're gonna test how good they are at their version of multiversal you know time travel stuff right so we're gonna find out obviously they're counting on the emotional weight of a resurrected gambit as one of apocalypse's henchmen i mean that's my only hope for that is a gambit retains most of his personality i, I want I'm, I'm fascinated to see if the cajun charmer can be twisted because if he's just a zombie i think he loses a lot of what makes him a great character and by the way in the inevitable when he somehow comes back even if he does it as a bad guy i just wanted to say when they i want someone to say to him how'd you come back and he says with style petite with style <laughs> that's, the, that's what i want for season two. <laughs> oh snap um it's gonna be interesting to see how he does it though yeah and who else is in the lineup, right? Because he usually has, right, four, right? He usually has a, a team. So we know one, but yeah. obviously they're leaving question marks for who else is going to be part of that. And there's a lot of characters they did not play in this season, which is great because that gives them room. And you're right, the ancient timeline versus the future one. Also, there's a lot of links there. I'm, obviously, Apocalypse appears multiple times, but that woman in the future, I think, is a, is another Summer. Summers. Rachel Summer? Yeah. I think so they've got like more fa branches on the summer's family tree because they obviously gave us a few nuggets and cameos not just with nathan this season not just with cable but like we also also had vulcan now we have rachel like so there's some there's some stuff there to play with if they want to yeah certainly it certainly it, it, it's gonna be interesting man that whole vulcan thing i'm interested in, in seeing if they decide to give us something outside of the X-Men and that story and how that all unfolds because that's crazy. Uh, but yeah, let us know anything else, Brian, before we wrap this one up. 
No, I mean, they obviously, the nice thing is season two is already written, right? It's done. So they already know exactly yes. where that's going. Um, I think season three, in some ways, it, it's which sounds like it's being prepped, it will be the challenge because Bo DeMeo is not on the show again. That's not a remark on whatever he did or didn't do. It's simply that he wrote season one through <clears throat> season two continuous. So you're getting a single mind and a single arc for the two first two seasons. And then things kind of change. So we'll see. But, um, but season two, I'm expecting even though it looks like it's a really grand plan, it clearly was a plan from the beginning. So I'm, I kind of trust that they'll, they'll get us to where we need to go. Yeah, so let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of, or what you thought of yeah. the last two episodes of the X-Men uh, 97 animated series. I assume you gave it a five. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yes. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, it's not much to, yeah. Brian, one last thing before we go. Yep. So the scribe <laughs> has been Never found. Right. Yep. For the live action X Men, which to me, Brian, I don't know if we need an X Men movie. Whatever happened to Bo DeMeo away from the X Men ninety seven production. He's someone who was involved with multiple Marvel projects even before he kind of was the showrunner for X-Men 97. Was there an original plan that involved him writing the movie? Would be the question I would want to know. Would that is this a we've had to ask around and try to hire somebody new because we the guy we thought was going to be maybe shepherding this is is no longer employed here. We'll never know that, but I, I am curious especially given how good this turned out and clearly how knowledge, again, we're only, we're only talking about the, the programming, how knowledgeable he proved to be regarding these characters and how to update them. The fact that we got to wait for that to happen and going in with that, those expectations, Brian, is going to, I don't know how, I don't know if it's going to affect the reception of that show, the third season. Yeah, I mean, we'll see when we get there. I, I still stand by my thought that, like, look, I mean, an X-Men movie is always an event. Obviously, you've got, you know, Deadpool and Wolverine kind of doing their thing this summer. But, I mean, I do think this show, which reportedly was, I believe, the third most streamed Disney Plus show ever, suggests the audience was be far beyond the hardcore people who would have showed up for this no matter what, yeah. which to me suggests that, there will be comparisons made. Like if and when we get casting, if and when we see writing, if and when we see the movie, people are going to sit there and be like, okay, this is, this is, you got a yeah, five-star yeah. animated show over here. Don't give me no three-star movie. Like I think yeah, there is yeah. going to be that. And, and I think it'll be a much more, much more of a microscope than the Brian Singer movie faced, which obviously very deliberately steered. Away. And by the way, Shouts to the writing in the finale where oh. they pay, pay back the line about the yellow spandex and the black leather. Like that was well-deserved and well-played and mm -hmm. kind of shows you where the world has come relative to 1999. But, mm -hmm. um, but that's what I mean. Like I think if they do anything of that level and that's what we get, it will be savaged and the, and the franchise will not go on the big screen where they want it to go. It almost makes me not want a live action. Movie. I mean, I, it, 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 Brian, I can go see season two in the theaters, Brian. That's how hype <laughs> you were to watch this when you spoke to people about the X Men. So, well, I still, you know, they've never tried this. We talked about this way back in the day. <laughs> when streaming was first kind of becoming a thing and Disney Plus was first becoming a thing, listen, they'll never do this. But if they did want to do something unique to leverage Disney Plus with the big screen, why not do a couple of character anthology series on Disney Plus as intros to save you the time? Like we talked about a Wolverine anthology series like five years ago. He's perfect like, for it. And that way you could put budget in, you could get your actor into the role. You don't have to do the exposition and then you build toward a movie event or two. You build toward a two-parter. And you've got all the backstory out of the way. And, and then you and you hook people say, look, 
you, you got to subscribe. You got to subscribe to see this great content. And then we're going to give you the payoff on the, the big screen, two parts, yeah. four hours, four and a half. They've never do it. But I just think like if they had, the, if Iger wanted to do something bold and Feige wanted to do that something bold. different with the X-Men, why not? That, that's the that library the, that you could do it with. That's the road that I would take as well. You could do a summer's family series. Like I'm still, like, you could do it. Storm could like Storm could carry a show like with satellite characters. I mean, it's there. Each Magneto, we season, know, could carry a show. Each season, it ends with Professor X, Professor X at the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But and they could have it playing almost Brian, almost around the same time leading up to the movie. I was just going to say the other line that I forgot to give homage to, but I had to say is why this show is next level is when Wolverine's lying there in that coma and Scott says, don't you dare break her heart. Do what you do best. I was like, that's it. <laughs> he, he, he can't stand that dude when he's yeah, 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 like, But yeah, in that yeah. moment, he knows his wife so well yeah, that he yeah. understands like this guy has to be around as much of a third wheel as he yeah. is. <laughs> He has to be around for her to be happy. Yeah. And I thought that was really, I thought that was out. I was the, that was an amazing line delivery. I thought. They, they just do those little things, Brian. Those little things. The show goes on. Yeah!